It's my pleasure to introduce Eric Traeger. He's the Esther K. Wagner Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy in Washington, D.C. Uh, Eric focuses on Egyptian politics and the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. He has lived, studied, and conducted research in Egypt. He was actually in Egypt right at the outbreak of the Ente Mubarak uh, revolution, I guess they called it, the January 25th revolution, uh, con doing his doctoral research on opposition movements in Egypt. Um, so Eric has a very harrowing tale of his <laughs> of his uh, swift departure. But in the context of that research, um, which culminated in his uh, PhD from University of Pennsylvania, he interviewed hundreds of uh, opposition leaders, Muslim Brotherhood members, many of the people who we read about daily that are in and out of prison. Um, so he had them on speed dial. Um, and uh, I think Eric's talk is going to be very insightful. So please join me in welcoming Eric Traeger. Thank you, and uh, thank you for that very warm introduction. It's really nice to be here. It's great to be in Pittsburgh, actually my first time. Um, and uh, thank you for taking a weekend to, uh, to learn a little bit about uh, the Middle East and, uh, and I guess U.S. policy there as well. The focus on my talk will be mostly historical. It'll be on the Muslim Brotherhood uh, during its uh, 85 years uh, as, a, as a movement. Um, but I'm happy to address policy questions during the, uh, during the Q&A, since policy is something that I, that I work on at uh, the Washington Institute, which of course is a think tank in DC. Anyway, I want to start you off by showing you uh, just kind of how strange the events of this summer are. I want to take you back to June uh, of 2012. I was actually in Egypt when Morsi uh, was, uh, was named the next president, and not only that, I was in Tahrir Square when the results were announced, and here was that scene. Mohamed Morsi is the next president. That's right, right? So what's it like to be in Tahrir Square when Morsi wins the election? It's kind of like being in the Bronx when the Yankees win the World Series, um, except that you know I'm a Mets fan, so I got out. Um, anyway, a little bit about that scene. Uh, I see we're not Mets fans here. That's cool. Um, a little bit about that, that scene. Uh, what you should take away from that is that for the Muslim Brotherhood, which, by the way, had been camped out in that square for about, uh, about 10 days by that point, um, protesting the dissolution of their parliament, a parliament they dominated, and also trying to put pressure on the military to name Morsi the next president. Um, uh, what that celebration signifies is that this was not just a political victory. This was not just you know, their guy winning a, a relatively fair and free, and it was, uh, presidential election. Uh, this for them was the realization of a certain political prophecy, a certain prophecy that is deeply embedded within the Brotherhood's ideology with the way they view history moving forward. I will explain what I mean by that very shortly. Fast forward to this summer, I was actually in Turkey when the June 30th protest against Morsi broke out. I, I'd been back and forth between Cairo a few times uh, during his presidency, but I was in Turkey when they broke out, and I flew back on July 2nd, the day before Morrissey was removed. And this is a, a scene that I shot on my uh, Blackberry from uh, Rab al Square, that's in northern Cairo, where the Muslim Brotherhood camped out. And here's what I saw. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
Now, what you're seeing there is basically Muslim brothers marching in formation, screaming, uh, strength, belief, Morsi's committees are everywhere. Morsi's men are everywhere. Maybe a few hundred of them, again, marching in formation, uh, carrying, in most cases, improvised weapons. There are kind of two ways of looking at this. One is, this is a Muslim Brotherhood militia. Um, which is definitely one of the narratives that emerged about the Brotherhood uh, with some justification during its year in power. But what I see in this is actually not, this is a Muslim Brotherhood militia. I see this is a pathetic organization that's on its very last legs of power, relying on a few hundred people, some of whom are carrying tree branches, kind of like a Lord of the Flies militia. Um, this is where the Brotherhood was at during its final hours in office. Far from being this strong, powerful ruling party, it had kind of come to this. And the question is, how did this happen? I'm going to get to that later, but what I want you to keep in mind is that this very narrative of rise and fall is something that is part and parcel of the Muslim Brotherhood's own history. It has, in fact, risen and fallen, I would argue and will argue and show, three times. But first, I want to start with a little background. The Muslim Brotherhood was founded in 1928 in Ismailia, that's a city in the central Suez Canal, um, by a man, a school teacher, just like yourself, so, you know, you might aspire to this, um, Hassan al-Banna. Um, Hassan al-Banna at the time was 22 years old. He was already um, a pretty well-established Islamic activist. He'd formed a number of Islamic societies during his youth. Um, but what's important to note here is that the Muslim Brotherhood emerges within a, a very important uh, intellectual environment. They emerge at this moment where Muslim thinkers are asking themselves the following question. Why is it that Islam which was on the cutting edge of science and technology and politics at the time of its founding, why is it that Islam has now fallen behind the West? Why is it that Islam is now not only backwards in comparison to the West, um, you know, uh, politically, in other words, the West is literally dominating much of the Islamic world through imperialism, but also culturally. Why is it that many of our people are looking to the West? Why is that? Why have we fallen behind? And one of the answers that was given during this period, which is generally considered between the years, let's say, 1880 and 1940, one of the answers that was given was, well, we need to revive Islam. We need to take Islam away from the current scholars who have allowed it to calcify, and we need to introduce something called ijtihad, um, questioning and reassessing Sharia principles, in other words, the broad legal principles of Islam. We also need to adopt from the West those things that work, but use them to revive Islam. For example, we can use elections. Elections are fine. That's a Western innovation, fine. But we can only use elections as a system of government or as a, as a way of picking our leaders if they are Islamic. In other words, or if a democratic system is used to implement the Sharia. In the more contemporary context, we can use the internet. I mean, you know, many Islamists, probably most Islamists, um, uh, certainly Islamist parties maybe, uh, use the internet. But it should be used to further and advance Islamist principles. Anyway, the idea was that we should try to revive Islam, why? As a way to challenge the West and resist Western cultural and political domination. So, um, what the, what, now what the Brotherhood added to this and what Hassan al-Banna added to this was the idea that the way to revive Islam as a way of resisting the West was through a strong organization through a vanguard, through the kind of organization that could over time reshape the individual, in other words, reshape its members, refocus them on Islam, then Islamize the society by growing this organization, then using that grassroots support to take over the state, and finally creating a global Islamic state that would counter the West. So when Morsi wins the presidency, for the Muslim Brotherhood, that means that they reached that point in their trajectory where they were establishing the Islamic State, right? So they were on, in other words, uh, stage three of four, so to speak, because they want to Islamize the individual, Islamize the society, 
Islamize the state, and then once they had established a number of brotherhood-dominated states, they would have a global Islamic state, which some describe as an Islamic League of Nations. I want to emphasize that deeply embedded in this ideology is hostility to the West. The whole point of why they want to do this, Islamize the individual, then the society, then the state, then the region, is to resist Western cultural and political domination. And finally, it's important to know the credo of the Muslim Brotherhood, especially if you're going to join the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, the credo is Allah is our objective, the Quran is our constitution, the Prophet is our leader, jihad is our way, and death for the sake of Allah is the highest of our aspirations. This is not some little factoid. This is a credo that Muslim brothers, you can watch it on YouTube, sing together when they are, uh, you know, say on bus rides going towards events, when they are in gatherings. This is, you know, a, a, a central component of their ideology. One other point I want to make here is that this whole idea of Islamize is actually not well defined. This is at its core what some would call a resistance ideology. The whole point is to get uh, people on board with the Muslim Brotherhood itself so that it could control the country politically and then resist the West. And what I mean by there's no real, you know, the, like Islamizes should not be taken literally, is that when you would ask, when I would ask Muslim Brotherhood leaders, what do you mean that you want to establish an Islamic state? What do you mean you want to implement the Sharia? What kind of policy are you going to put forward now that you're in power and you can implement the Sharia? They never, ever had an answer. They never had any idea. They don't have any real intellectual uh, discourse about how to interpret the Sharia and what kinds of policies should come. So that's the thing. Islamize ultimately becomes a code word for the Muslim Brotherhood taking power and then resisting the West. And I'm going to show that, I think, a bit more convincingly, I hope, in the remainder of this presentation. Um, so don't take it from me what the Muslim Brotherhood's vision is. Let's talk to Mohammed Morsi. This is a clip from my interview with him in August 2010. There are people who think that this country will never ever stand on his or steps on his legs unless Islam is in the background. So that's what we are trying to implement in the society, not for uh, governing ourselves. No, this is not our goal, but our goal is the country be governed by Islamic principles to implement the, the Constitution. The, the Constitution should represent and reflect people well and desires. So, That's freedom. Let me, let me. So you can see I tried to cut him off there. Um, you do not cut off Mohammed Morsi. Very difficult man. Uh, I could talk about that more in the Q&A. The point here that I want you to focus on um, is this part. The Constitution, remember, Constitution, that's a, that's a Western kind of innovation, but the Brotherhood can live with that so long as it's used to implement Sharia principles, by the way, which they have never defined. But the important point here, the Constitution should represent and reflect the people's will and desires, and that's freedom. Note that for the Muslim Brotherhood, freedom is not freedom from religious rule, which is the way we define it here in the United States, right? Freedom, one of the components of freedom is, you know, the, the right to worship whoever you want, the right to practice your religion however you want, so long as you don't intrude on others' rights in that same regard. But for the Muslim Brotherhood, the natural state of Egyptian society is Islamic. Uh, all Egyptians who are Muslim, in their view, are likely to be Islamists, and the only reason why Egypt, until the, uh, the revolution, was not in any way an Islamic state was because it was imposed from the West, because a dictatorship or some other cultural factor was imposed on the West. So for the Brotherhood, freedom is resisting secularism, resisting non-Islamism, and having a constitution that reflects the society as they see it. In other words, the society that, in their view, is as it should be, which is an Islamic one. I hope that's clear. For the Brotherhood, freedom means the freedom to have an Islamic state, and anything that is not an Islamic state is inherently unfree, as opposed 
opposed by the West, and that's something that they're trying to resist. How do they do this? How do they go about trying to Islamize the individual, Islamize the society, Islamize the state, and then form a global Islamic state? I mentioned the vanguard. This was Hassan al-Banna's primary innovation. The Muslim Brotherhood is not like any democratic, small d, political party that you know. Becoming a Muslim brother is not like becoming a Democrat or Republican or Green Party member or whatever. Becoming a Muslim brother is in fact a five to eight year indoctrination process known as tarbiya, which literally means education. It starts at recruitment. Muslim brothers have recruiters at mosques and universities who go out and try to find people who they think will be good fits. In other words, you don't just walk into a brotherhood office and submit an application. They look for you. They select people they think will be good fits. Who do they look for? Well, there's this myth that Islamist organizations go for the losers, right? They go for the people that can't find work, are very frustrated, and therefore turn towards some sort of religious ideology to pick them up. That's actually not the case of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood goes for winners. The Muslim Brotherhood wants the high school president. It wants the best soccer player. It wants the, the best man on campus. Why? Because the Brotherhood is trying to create this grassroots organization that will Islamize the society so it can Islamize the state and then form a global Islamic state. That means it needs winners. It needs people that other people will want to follow. Once it finds the people that it's going to recruit, um, they are called a mohib, which means fan. The stage of mohib lasts about six months to a year. And at this stage, the Muslim Brotherhood is getting to know you mostly through social, non-religious activities soccer games, camping outings, dramatic uh, events, maybe some community service type work, and they're watching you. Does he pray five times a day? Does he give charity? Does he fast on Ramadan? Is he a good Muslim? Is he someone who wants to try to you know, undertake our agenda of Islamizing the society? Is he going to be committed? At some point during this stage, they confront him and say, listen, we're the Muslim Brotherhood. Many times, muhibs don't know that they're being recruited necessarily. At the end of this phase, the Muslim brother, that's aspiring Muslim brother, is, uh, is given a test, written or oral. If he passes, he's made a mu'ayyid. Mu'ayyid means supporter. At this stage, a Muslim brother is given some low-level responsibility. Maybe he will preach in a mosque. Maybe he will play some role in recruitment. He's also given the Brotherhood's curriculum, which starts with some Quranic memorization, some reading of standard texts of the Muslim Brotherhood, Hassan al-Banna, Sayyid Qutb, other types of Islamist works. At the end of one, to two, of one to three years, he's given an exam, maybe oral, maybe written, um, and he's made a muntasib, which means affiliated. At this stage, the Muslim brother starts giving roughly six to eight percent of his income to the organization. I get a lot of questions. Where does the brotherhood get its money? I don't know. No one's ever shown me the briefcases. Um, but if the Muslim Brotherhood has roughly, let's say, 500,000 members, and all of them give 6 to 8% of their income, and many of them are winners, many of them are wealthy people, elites, upper middle class, I believe the Brotherhood has a pretty substantial base of uh, financial support from within its own members. Once again, the curriculum intensifies. There's more memorization of the Quran, uh, deeper readings. At the end of this phase, he's given a test, maybe oral, maybe written. And he's made a muntazim or an organizer. At this stage, the Muslim brother is finally allowed to vote in internal brotherhood elections for his leaders. He's given more responsibility. He's allowed to lead what's called an usra or a family. I'll explain that in the next slide. That's a cell of Muslim brothers. Um, once uh, this, this period ends, he's given a test, and he's finally made an Ah Amal or a working brother. What is the point of this? The point of this system is to vet Muslim brothers over a very prolonged period. Five to eight years is merely an approximation. I've met people who it took 10 years to go through this. The point is to vet all Muslim brothers for their commitment to the cause, and their willingness to take orders from the Brotherhood's leadership. That's to say that the Brotherhood is a totalitarian cult. Why do I say that? Because at the end of this process, Muslim brothers take an Islamic oath known as a bayah to, quote, listen and obey decisions that are taken by their leadership. 
And this is a system that has existed since the Brotherhood's founding, because remember, Hassan al-Banna wanted a vanguard, a strong organization that would be committed to taking over the society so it could take over the state so that it could create a global Islamic state. All right, what do you do with these deeply committed people? Well, the Muslim Brotherhood has a nationwide chain of command that's shaped like a pyramid. Again, this is not standard of political parties. When the leader of the Democratic Party in the United States, who arguably would be the president himself, says that the Democrats should do something, they don't always follow, right? Uh, people who are registered as Democrats won't necessarily vote for the people that he endorses. I mean, it's, there's no listen and obey. But the Muslim Brotherhood is not a democratic party, it's a totalitarian one, and it's built on obedience. At the lowest level is the family or the usra that I mentioned. This is a cell. This is an organization of roughly five to eight Muslim brothers who meet weekly for about three hours. They discuss politics, they discuss their personal lives, um, they, uh, they uh, you know, do the curriculum, reading Quran, discussing Quran. They discuss local organization. Remember, these cells, these families, are scattered all over the country. So if there's going to be a, a social service drive, you know, a, a medical caravan, at the local level, it'll be organized at the USRA level. Uh, if uh, there's going to be elections, the Muslim Brotherhood decides, okay, we're going to do kiosks at every polling place. Well, the way to do that is through having each family set up a bridge table with laptops telling people who to vote for. That's actually what happened during the first round of the parliamentary elections in 2011. I saw it myself. So um, the family is important because the members of your brotherhood family become your best friends. If you're sick, the members of your family take care of you and your nuclear family. If you fall into economic hardships, the members of your brotherhood family help you out. What the Brotherhood has done through the family, through the USRA, is embed social relationships into the organization. So one reason why you'll follow orders is because you've taken an oath and you believe in it and they've vetted that over a five to eight year period. Second reason why you will follow orders is because there's peer pressure. All of your closest friends in your family are doing it. The rest of this is very administrative. Six of 12 families makes up a sha'aba or a populace. A number of those makes up a muntaka or an area. Then you have the governor level, basically the province. There are 28 provinces in Egypt. Then you have the kita or the sector level. Um, this is, uh, you know, groups of provinces. And then at the very top of this, you have the guidance office known as Maktab al-Irshad. And that's comprised of about 18 very senior leaders, all of whom, by the way, have had to have had that top level of membership for at least 10 years, that Ach Amal level for 10 years. And it's advised by the S's cut off, the Shura Committee. Shura means consultation. It's the legislative body comprised of about 110 members. Um, so you will understand flow charts, very simple. Uh, the Brotherhood is voting on, on what it should do. Uh, should it participate in the demonstrations? Voted on the Shura Council executed by the guidance office, which sends the command down the chain. And when you have these deeply committed members and you have this well-organized pyramidal command chain, you understand that this is very useful for a social movement. It's useful for, for organizing social services, which is one of the key ways that the Brotherhood tried to Islamize the society. Food distribution drives, medical caravans, helping out in disaster relief. Brotherhood did an amazing job because look at how well organized it was. Look at how well, how well funded it was. Very good for organizing demonstrations. January 27, 2011, you may recall, this was a Thursday, um, the Mubarak regime shut off all internet and phone communications or at least cell phone communications in the country. The Brotherhood still helped mobilize the largest protests, I believe, until, uh, you know, at that point in the country's history. You had bigger ones this summer. how they do it despite having no internet and no cell phones? Well, they have this person-to-person -person nationwide network. And that, that following day, January 28, 2011, Friday of Rage, that was a pivotal day in the uprising when the protesters propelled, I, I would argue, in large part by the Brotherhood, um, managed to overwhelm the police. And in my view, more, uh, Mubarak was not returning after that. This structure is good for electioneering, for setting up uh, campaigns, distributing campaign literature. I recall asking a young Muslim brother, what did you have to do 
during Morsi's presidential campaign. And I should add that this young Muslim brother told me that he didn't even want to vote for Morsi. He didn't like Morsi, but listen and obey. He had no choice. He took an oath. So what did you have to do during the presidential campaign? He said, I had to mobilize a hundred, a hundred unique people to vote for Morsi, and each of my comrades had to do the same, a hundred people. I don't know what it says about me. I don't think I can mobilize five hundred unique people each. And when you're well structured like this, that's what you're able to do. And of course, if you and only you have this system, it's obvious that you're going to win elections. Remember, once Mubarak's ruling party falls in 2011, only the Muslim Brotherhood is well organized to win elections, which is why it does so. All right, I want to talk a little bit about the Brotherhood's history. There are basically three phases in which the Brotherhood rose and fell, and I think we're on the tail end of that third phase, and I'm going to go into detail as to how I think that happened. But let's start with the history. Brotherhood is founded in 1928 by Hassan al-Banna. It starts in Ismail Lia. It moves, I believe, in 1931 to Cairo, sets up its first headquarter there. By 1938, it has 300 offices nationwide. In the 1938 Conference of the Muslim Brotherhood, the fifth conference, Hassan al-Banna declares that the Muslim Brotherhood will now start executing its strategy, that, it's, that it has built up itself, it will now start executing, and by the 1940s begins participating in elections. As it emerges as this major political societal force, and if you understand how it works and how it's structured, you can see very clearly how that might happen, um, it starts facing repression. So in 1942, uh, the Waft government uh, bans the, doesn't ban the Muslim Brotherhood. It shuts down most of its satellite headquarters and only allows it to keep a central headquarter. In 1945, the Waft party forges the elections to make sure the Brotherhood loses. Around this time, the Muslim Brotherhood forms what's known as the secret apparatus. This is an armed militia, uh, and it starts undertaking attacks against the British and against the regime itself. The secret apparatus also participates, by the way, in the 1948 uh, war in, uh, in, in, in Israel that becomes Israel's war of independence. In fact, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood participates in that war well beyond the point that the Egyptian military withdraws from that war, which remains a major point of pride for the Muslim Brotherhood, one reason why I personally don't believe that had they remained in power, they would have kept the treaty. They're very proud of their role in having uh, fought uh, well beyond anyone else uh, in that war. Um, in 1948, uh, the, uh, the, the government becomes very concerned about this armed militia, and again, this is all in this context of the government repressing them, the Brotherhood taking up arms, and in December of 1948, a young Muslim brother assassinates the prime minister. A few months later, on what would, have been, uh, what would have been the 140th birthday of Abraham Lincoln, it's a total uh, irrelevant coincidence, um, Hassan al -Banna, uh, is assassinated. Um, now, why do I say that this is the tail end of a, of a, of a, of a certain rise and fall for the Brotherhood? Um, because if you understand the way the Brotherhood works as an organization, its pyramidal structure, you understand that it actually can't function if it's decapitated. That's the one major vulnerability of the Brotherhood. It's like a mafia. You take out the Don, you take out Kapo regimes, all you're left with are a bunch of, let's call them activists, who don't really know what to do. Because they've been taught to listen and obey, and who are they listening and obeying now? So Hassan al bans assassination uh, you know, marks the, the end of that first phase. The second phase begins a few years later. Um, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood begins, enter, begins a, a dialogue with what becomes known as the Free Officers, a group of officers within the Egyptian military who start considering and conspiring to oust King Farouk. In 1952, this happens ultimately in July, um, the, uh, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, hatches certain agreements with the Free Officers. They will uh, monitor uh, Egyptians who are viewed as unpatriotic, in other words, 
un insufficiently supportive of the removal of King Farouk. Uh, they will safeguard the embassies. They will mobilize people into the streets to support the, the removal of King Farouk um, in the event that the public doesn't look sufficiently enthusiastic. This level of coordination uh, mostly happens in terms of, you know, uh, prior to the removal of Farouk. Uh, the Brotherhood doesn't play a critical role once that revolution, once that coup, whatever you want to call it, uh, begins. But nonetheless, you have a very high-level, sustained kind of dialogue between the free officers and the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, the Brotherhood, of course, thinks that it should get a reward for this. It played a key role in bringing Muhammad Naguib and then shortly thereafter uh, Nasser to power. It, it you know, was willing to do a lot to help the free officers remove King Farouk. But because, uh, and, and they asked for a role in government, but the, uh, the military regime that takes over and is you know, still running the country to this day declines. And over time, uh, very quickly actually, that military regime starts cracking down on opposition parties, putting Waftists on trial, the Wafts being one of the dominant parties, the dominant party prior to uh, Farouk's removal and, and during, during Farouk's tenure, um, and also starts moving against the Muslim Brotherhood. Now you have an internal conflict uh, in 1953 and 1954 among the free officers where Nasser starts trying to get rid of Mohammed Naguib the first president of Egypt following Farouk's removal. The Brotherhood makes the perilous decision of backing Mohammed Naguib. He loses, so Nasser comes to power. Then in 1954, you have an assassination attempt on Nasser uh, that is blamed on the Muslim Brotherhood. Was the Muslim Brotherhood behind it? Was it some Muslim Brotherhood activist? What exactly happened? This remains a very contested part of history, but the results are not so contested. Uh, Nasser uses this as a pretext for totally cracking down on the Muslim Brotherhood, arresting the, Sup the Supreme Guide of the Brotherhood, sending thousands of Muslim Brothers to prison, and this type of crackdown persists up until Nasser's death in 1970. Um, during this time, uh, Said Qutb, who Sam mentioned in his talk, is among the Muslim Brothers imprisoned. In 1965, he writes a very important book, called Milestones. And the, the argument, or it's also called Signposts in the Road, it's, uh, it's uh, translated in a number of ways. The key argument of Milestones is as follows. Uh, we are living in a time that's analogous to the pre-Islamic period known as Jahiliya. Jahiliya means ignorance. And therefore, what Muslims have to do is engage in jihad uh, to revive Islam not only by resisting the West, but mainly and primarily by resisting the non-Islamic rulers that are running the, these Muslim countries themselves. It's revolutionary in the sense that it's not just focusing on external rulers, but internal ones. And about a year later, in 1966, Said Qutb is hung. Um, many people look at this period and the imprisonment and crackdown on the Muslim Brotherhood as something that spawns these kinds of radical ideas and then movements. Um, I think that's actually uh, not questionable in one sense. It's true that many radical ideas emerge from this period and, and in that context of a crackdown. But it's also important to note that the very idea of trying to Islamize society to take over the state, to create a global Islamic state that will challenge the West, is not itself a particularly nonviolent idea. But I move on. Phase three is undoubtedly the longest phase in this uh, rise and fall kind of arc. So it starts shortly after Nasser dies in, uh, in 1970, uh, then uh, Sadat takes over, and Sadat starts loosening up on Islamists in general, and particularly the Muslim Brotherhood. Why? Because Sadat um, needed to wrap himself in some form of legitimacy. You see, Nasser was a force of nature. He had charisma, he had personality. When Nasser died, uh, millions of people poured into the streets crying. When Nasser you know, uh, lost the 1967 war and, uh, and resigned temporarily, millions poured into the streets. He remains, despite being a dictator, uh, a beloved figure, someone who's seen as charismatic and glorious and, and, uh, and someone who uh, had dignity and pride and all this. Sadat didn't really have that, so he needed something else. 
And one of those things he needed was Islam. He started using Islam as a way to validate his own rule and trying to engage and soften uh, his, uh, his approach towards Islamists. Also, he wanted Islamists to counter the Nasserists on campus and in political life. He needed somebody to counter this personality cult of Nasser that he viewed as a major threat. So what happens is you have these Muslim Brotherhood leaders who had been in prison in many cases since the 1950s and 60s suddenly released from prison. And they start engaging young Islamists on campus. You see, around this time, you had a number of what were called gama'at forming at, um, at Egyptian universities, Islamic societies that Muslim brothers coming out of prison started reaching out to and uh, gradually incorporating into the organization. Some of the very important leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood in the uh, 90s and 2000s and even after the revolution emerged in this climate, um, one of whom was recently arrested, Assam al Aryan, a well-known figure, another, Abdelman al Fatou, who actually resigned from the Brotherhood. I could discuss these more in the Q&A. Um, then under Mubarak, of course, uh, of course, you know the uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, um, you know, it, it, it reemerges in the 70s. It's briefly cracked down upon towards the end of Sadat's reign. He puts many of them in prison. The Supreme Guide in prison, but he's assassinated uh, in uh, in 1981, October 6th. Then when Mubarak comes to power, he again loosens the reins a bit on the Brotherhood. Under Mubarak, the Brotherhood becomes banned, officially banned, banned since the 1950s legally but tolerated. They're allowed to do social services, sort of. They're allowed to participate in politics sometimes. They're allowed to have offices sometimes. What you have is a cycle of permission and then repression, but never to the degree that you find um, under Nasser. Never to the extent that they're just you know, imprisoning the entire guidance office and the Supreme Guide. Actually, the Supreme Guide is never imprisoned under Mubarak. So Mubarak lets this organization exist. He pressures it by sometimes throwing their leaders in prison, but he never decapitates it. And in fact, he lets them run in elections many of the time. So for example, in 2005, what was arguably the freest election of his reign, again, that's a very relative word, a free election under Mubarak, the Muslim Brotherhood, in fact, wins 20% of the parliament. And here you can see them uh, protesting in parliament the, uh, the uh, emergency law. So what you had at the time that Mubarak falls is the Muslim Brotherhood at actually, you know, actually in a very, very good place. Well organized, yes, repressed a bit over the years, but still coherent, still with its structure, with a strong structure, with nationwide offices, with cells known as families scattered all over the country. So how did it fall so fast? Well, you understand how it rose because it was the only organization structured to win elections. I think I made that argument effectively, I hope, earlier. How did it fall so fast, though? Well, two things. First of all, within its year in power, I'm speaking specifically of Morsi's year in power, it alienated most, many, I should say, probably most non-Muslim Brotherhood Egyptians. Remember that the Muslim Brotherhood is only roughly 250,000, according to a former deputy supreme guide, I'm going to name drop here, uh, Morsi told me, it was 750,000, so I like to say maybe 500,000. So only 500,000 in a country of 90 million means that it's an organization that actually depends on substantial non-Muslim Brotherhood support. And it alienated them in its year in power. And secondly, and arguably more importantly, it managed to alienate uh, the state itself to the point where Morsi lost control of the state. Here you see an image of um, police in uniform protesting uh, during uh, this summer's uprising. You know, when you don't control the police, when you don't control ministries, when you never control the military, well, you're a president in name only. And there's only so long that you can remain a president in name only, especially in a poor country where the standards of living are in fact declining under your rule. How did this happen? Well, you have to go back to the structure, because just as this structure is a real asset for winning power, it becomes a real liability once you've taken power. So in power, um, this very structure that's very good for winning elections 
Well, the Brotherhood started using it as a tool for policymaking. So Muslim Brotherhood, an organization that had never really controlled anything beyond its own organization, um, starts you know, creating a political platform. But it creates that platform within its guidance office and Shura Committee. It's called the Renaissance Project. It claims to be an economic platform. In fact, it's a list of economic aspirations. We will be a G20 country. Uh, we will have this level of growth. We will do this. But it's not an actual plan. It's like, uh, it's like an Eric Traeger plan being, I'm going to pitch for the Mets. That's not a plan. That's an aspiration. And because they're not reaching out, because they're not soliciting any kind of input, um, you know, they, they become, they, they, uh, they, they essentially fail in power. One other thing that's important here, uh, they start making decisions that are, that are geared towards quickly consolidating their control over the state. And they make these decisions in a very insular way. So the most damaging of these occurs last November when President Morsi releases a constitutional declaration in which he puts his edicts above any judicial scrutiny and also prevents the Brotherhood-dominated Constitutional Assembly from being dissolved by court order. Well, Egyptians are pretty upset about this, so they respond with mass protests outside the presidential palace. What you could see in this photo is that in this case, the tanks are in fact defending the palace, unlike this summer. And when the Brotherhood, uh, the Brotherhood responds by trying to ram through a constitution to completion, one that it played a dominating role in writing, the protests continue, and when the protests don't go away, the Brotherhood responds through its structure by sending cadres out to attack protesters, and about eight to 10 people are killed in the ensuing fighting. This was a major moment in Morsi's presidency because it was a case in which the Brotherhood which is already starting to lose support, actually used this tightly knit structure to command cadres to attack people as in any kind of fascist party. And so very quickly, things start to break down politically. In uh, December of 2012, you have the emergence of the National Salvation Front, a, uh, a union of key uh, non-Islamist political figures that that you know, kind of speaks not very effectively for, or, or let's say claims to speak for the opposition. So you have the Nasserist Hamdin Sabahi, the former AE, uh, IAEA chief, uh, Mohammed al Baradai, and the former foreign minister, Amr Musa. Then you have January 2013 onward, uh, constant violent protests against the Brotherhood. Why violent? Well, I would ask this to activists. Why do you use violence against the Brotherhood? They said, well, they use violence against us. We are trying to deter further violence from the Brotherhood in their military-like structure. Now, I'm not, I don't mean to justify that at all. I want to be very clear. I'm actually disturbed by this, and I'll tell you a disturbing story. I was in Suez in uh, March, or in, excuse me, in late February, and I'm interviewing a guy. He's 20 years old. He's, you know, looks very normal. He's wearing a sweater. He's, you know, gelled back hair like a normal 20-year-old. And I said, um, what happened outside the Brotherhood headquarters right here? This is actually a photo of that in Suez. Um, earlier this month, I read that the Brotherhood headquarters had been torched by your group. And he said, well, here's what happened. Uh, I and my friends, we were protesting outside the Brotherhood headquarters. The Brotherhood threw you know, stuff down on us, and we responded by torching it. And I thought, well, you know, that's not, that's not very proportionate. Um, but then I kept asking. Right? I kept asking some questions. I said, uh, let me ask you a question. How do you burn a headquarter? You know, like, how, how do you do arson? And, uh, well, what came out is that actually the Brotherhood had not thrown things down on him and his friends. Uh, he and his friends had gone up to a neighboring building. They had thrown things down on police that were protecting the Brotherhood headquarter to create a distraction. The police dispersed. They then started raining down Molotov cocktails on that building while his colleagues burned it from the bottom, and they burned it at both ends. So what you saw in Egypt earlier this spring was a total breakdown of the political order where these kinds of violent clashes, violent assaults on the Brotherhood, Brotherhood countering with violence, uh, you know, becoming a, 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 an important part of political life in Egypt. Then in April 2013, you have the emergence of the Tamarud campaign, meaning rebellion. 
Um, this was a petition campaign that really was calling for early elections, but soon became about completely removing Morsi. Um, claims to have gathered 22 million signatures. Do not trust that number for a minute, um, but nonetheless became a very important feature of Egyptian political life. So basically, Morsi lost support very quickly after he tried to seize power. What I'm saying is he tried to seize power um, because of the insular goals and the insular nature of the Brotherhood. But that's not all. He also started losing the state. See, the Brotherhood tried to use its structure as a tool for consolidation, and it did this by appointing two top guidance office members, uh, Assam al-Haddad and Moe Hamed, to be presidential advisors. And in coordination with the Brotherhood's guidance office, Morsi started uh, appointing top Muslim brothers to top positions across the Egyptian government. According to one study, up to 13,000 Muslim brothers were appointed to key positions across the Egyptian government during Morsi's year in power. Now, there's an obvious response to what I'm pointing out here. So what? Morsi was elected. Uh, when presidents are elected, they tend to appoint people from their own party. He's a Muslim brother. He appoints Muslim brothers. What's the problem? And that's a very fair response. I want to emphasize here, I'm not making a moral argument. Say, Senator, of course you're being elected. We will be closing at 30 minutes at 5 p.m. Thank you. I want to emphasize here that I'm not making a moral argument um, against these appointments. What I'm simply pointing out is that um, in many cases, he appointed people, because the Muslim brother had never been in government, who had no experience. And he was seen as appointing people who were appointed solely due to their proximity to top leaders in the Muslim Brotherhood. If you understand the Muslim Brotherhood, it's obvious that he would do that, because the Muslim Brotherhood is trying to consolidate its control over the state so it could then form the global Islamic state with other Brotherhood states. But within the institutions of the government themselves, this was rejected. Let's put it like this. Imagine somebody is elected president of the United States, and he's doing his appointments for the State Department. And he appoints people who have not only never worked in foreign policy, have never really read a book on foreign policy, they've never traveled. So across the State Department, in the key leadership positions, you have people who know absolutely nothing about foreign policy. Well, the State Department would either go rogue or would basically cease to function as an institution. That is what happened in Egypt across the government. So you had large bureaucracies unresponsive to Muslim Brotherhood officials. You had police, as the situation started breaking down, refusing to guard Brotherhood headquarters and then later joining the protesters in the streets. By the winter, you had intel officials encouraging Tamarud activists, or the people who became Tamarud activists, to start rising up, telling them in private meetings, you know, the time might be ripe. This guy can't last. And then finally, you had the military join the removal of Morsi, uh, fanning the flames of the June 30th protest. Here you have a photo of military helicopters uh, dropping flags down on anti-Morsi protesters during that uprising. The fact that they were US Apache helicopters does create some real complications for US policy officials. We can discuss that. So what are the consequences of a coup? And I use that word because analytically speaking, that's what it was. Uh, it's not only a coup. There was a real mass uprising, millions and millions of people in the streets, no question about it. Um, but the mechanism through which Morsi was removed was the military stepping in and saying, excuse me. I mean, you know, when a, when, a, when a general gets on TV and says, you're not going to see your president anymore, that's a coup. Well, the consequences are you have a deeply divided Egyptian society. You have some who were very unnerved by the Brotherhood, saw this as a secretive organization trying to consolidate and control the country, take power for their exclusive use, and they are thrilled that Morsi and the Brotherhood are gone. You also have those who believe that something has been stolen from them. And they're likely to continue protesting for a while. And the military has responded to this by, well, in one part, cracking down on the Muslim Brotherhood. Muslim Brotherhood had a massive protest site in northern Cairo and in Giza. 
crack down on them. In August, about a thousand Muslim brothers have been killed. But maybe more importantly for our study of the Brotherhood, what's happened is the Brotherhood has been decapitated. The top, the top leadership and the provincial leadership have largely been arrested or are on the run. A couple are abroad, and we should discuss that. But what that means is that this organization can't function like a mafia, can't function when the Don and the Kappa regimes are behind bars. The question is, what happens to the rank and file? What happens to maybe a few hundred thousand Muslim brothers don't know what to do with themselves, don't have anyone to follow, but will probably have to do something? Well, they have a couple choices, one of which is they can go home. Frankly, I don't think that's likely. I don't think it's likely because, first of all, they're at least committed to that vision that they should be controlling the state. And also, they've lost many of their friends in the crackdown, either in prison or, or killed. So they're not likely to go home. Well, they might turn towards more radical activities. It's possible. Many of them embrace kind of Salafist ideas in general. Um, there's certainly the historical example of people who rose up in the Muslim Brotherhood, that's Zawahiri, right? Or, or, or uh, sensitive to Brotherhood ideas, turning towards more radical ideas. Possibility. They may just keep protesting creating temporary instability every Friday, you know, being, not going home, flash mobs, also possible. Um, what do I actually think they'll do? Well, a little of all of the above. I think they're still trying to figure out. What might be some ways that this organization can resuscitate itself? Because the truth is that if the Brotherhood is fundamentally an organization, it doesn't really have much of an idea other than it should be an organization that controls things, well, it can't continue to exist if it can't be an organization. So here are three things that I could imagine happening um, that would allow the Brotherhood to reemerge a fourth time. First of all, at some point in the future, probably not soon, rank and file who have not been arrested may try to rebuild this in the same way that sometimes when a mafia is decapitated the rank and file, the foot soldiers come together and they appoint one of them Don and a few of them Kapo regimes. That could happen, won't happen soon because there's a climate of fear, there's a major crackdown, but a couple years, possible. Maybe they'll run for elections within electoral districts, something, you know, they'll run as independents. Remember that what's been cracked down upon are those top levels but the lower levels have not been arrested, as far as we can tell, to the same extent. And those districts may correspond geographically to electoral districts. So it would be very easy to imagine that if they made that strategic decision, let's run as independents, they can mobilize very effectively at the local level, return to parliament, and over time reemerge. The final way that this could happen is from abroad. Like I said, a number of top leaders managed to escape the country. Mahmoud Hussein, who I've interviewed, Secretary General of the organization, was last spotted in Doha. He's been reportedly meeting with Muslim Brotherhood lawyers, trying to help Morsi with his trial, trying to coordinate activities for the Brotherhood at the international level. He's not the only top leader who's abroad right now. It's very possible that there might be some way in which he can commandeer people on the ground from abroad, especially with other leaders who have escaped. It's possible it will be a challenge, but it's possible. Another factor to consider here is that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood's media office has now moved to London. This is Abdullah al-Haddad. He is the son of a guidance office member who was effectively Morsi's national security advisor, Assam al-Haddad. You saw him in the previous slide. His brother, Gahad al-Haddad, was an English-speaking spokesman recently arrested. He is now one of the spokesmen working out of that London office. And it's very possible that by going abroad, they set up the possibility that they could reorganize there, stay alive there, and return to Egypt if conditions change, if something happens to the current military government. In other words, the Brotherhood has these ways of kind of waiting things out but the question is whether they'll make that strategic choice or whether without their leaders as free men, uh, they're unable to make that choice and will therefore be basically cracked out of existence 
which I also think, by the way, is a possibility. Thank you for listening. Excellent. So let's take some questions. First one in the back. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. You, uh, you mentioned a little bit about the leadership structure, and then you, I, I'm, I'm just curious, do family connections matter in this at all? Um, and do the, I, presumably, sons of some of these higher up officials uh, go through the exact same process? Uh, great question. Um, I, I think the answer is yes and no. Um, there are definitely some very well established Muslim Brotherhood families. Um, where, you know, for generations these guys have been Muslim brothers and, uh, and therefore, you know, they become elites within the organization. The Haddads are one family like that. The Maliks are a family like that. Um, uh, and, and, of course, among brotherhood leaders, um, there, there's a whole host of int uh, intramarriages. So, you know, uh, a top leader's uh, married to another top leader's sister, things like that. Um, now, if you want to, uh, to join the Muslim Brotherhood, there's that system I described, but if you're the son of a Muslim Brother, uh, uh, a Muslim brother member, um, you can actually join at an earlier age through what's called the Ashbal. If you are a male, it's, it basically means cubs, like Cub Scouts. You could join, I think, as early as nine. And uh, Zuhara, which means roses, uh, if, you're, if you're a female, you could join the Muslim Sisterhood that way. There's a parallel sisterhood organization. Um, so, uh, so there are special activities for the children of Muslim brothers, but of course, you know, in many cases, uh, the children of Muslim brothers do not join the Brotherhood. Remember that, um, you know, Muslim Brotherhood is a society of strong, true believers. Uh, so, uh, and it's also a hard organization to join. So, in many cases, people won't take the risks that have been historically associated with being a Muslim brother. So you have many families in which, um, you know, maybe the father is a Muslim brother, but not all of his children are. I'll just wait for the microphone. Sorry. Yeah, I yeah. did, I just. Sorry. Thanks. Uh, as the Mubarak regime was coming down, and it seemed clear that the Muslim Brotherhood might be the ones that would fill the vacuum, it seemed like the narrative that was coming across that the Muslim Brotherhood was a very different one from its from its uh, earlier history. How did they pull that off? And in your opinion, was that uh, an accurate assessment by the Western media in particular? So there was this, um, this uh, narrative, as you described, that I would say really began in the post 9-11 period of the moderate Muslim Brotherhood. And there was a, a big, uh, ma a major foreign affairs article, I believe in 2007, called the moderate Muslim Brotherhood that basically had two authors who went around talking to Muslim brothers and repeating uh, what Muslim brothers would say about democracy at face value without really looking under the hood and saying, you know, and asking whether uh, these pronouncements about the Brotherhood's uh, commitment to democracy really matched with the way the organization worked. Now, why did this literature emerge? I think my own view is that it emerged because in the post-9-11 period, you had a class of scholars who really wanted to believe um, uh, you know, that, that there was an Islamist alternative to al-Qaeda. And of course there is. I mean, the Muslim Brotherhood is, is very different from al-Qaeda. It's much less violent. I mean, it's not even comparable to its violence. Its ambitions are, are, in, are actually a bit less global in a way. Um, so it's a very, it's a very, very different organization, but uh, that doesn't make it moderate. I mean, you know, if your standard of moderation is Al Qaeda, then you know, I mean, th that's not a great standard of uh, of comparison. Um, and and my my feeling, quite frankly, is that a lot of the scholars and experts who argue that the Brotherhood um, was uh, was moderate and democratic and committed to elections and all this um, really just didn't know about this. I mean, they, they didn't ask, well, what's the experience of a Muslim brother like? Is, is that experience really just about doing social services and elections? Or is there something deeper going on there? And what troubles me about that is that even though, um, I mean, I was frankly, not to toot my own horn here, one of the few to write about this very system in 2011, um, 
I was not the first person to write about this or study this. I mean, this is something that um, uh, uh, Richard Mitchell, in his uh, classic text on the Muslim Brotherhood from the 1960s, describes in great detail that this is how the Brotherhood works. Um, it's something, by the way, that's also reflected in Hassan al-Banna's writings. And my, my honest feeling is that many of those scholars who argued there's a moderate organization that would rule democratically just didn't do the homework. Um, and how did I get to this? I just want to tell that story. I was interviewing a young Muslim brother, actually a, former, a, a young former Muslim brother, in uh, 2010 when I was starting my dissertation research, and he was, he was kind of boring me to death. And, uh, and I wanted to just change it up. So I said to him, how did you become a Muslim brother? Like, like what made you decide to do it? How did you become a Muslim brother? And he told me about this whole system of joining, of internal promotion. You go from this stage to this stage, and it took me many years. And, I mean, that, that blew my mind because until then, I mean, I certainly was not inclined to think that they were liberal, um, but, uh, but I didn't realize that it's basically a cult. And I think that had policymakers been more aware of that, had experts done their job um, a little bit more diligently, maybe we would have had a slightly different response um, when the Brotherhood ultimately won power. By the way, I don't believe we could have prevented that or should have prevented that. I mean, you look at the way they're structured, you recognize that they're the only ones structured that way. I mean, you can't prevent that. Um, and, uh, and we should be very aware of what foreign policy can achieve. It's not typically good at playing domestic politics in countries 6,000 miles away. I'll take the next question from Alan Luxembourg. Well, actually, you started uh, touching on my question in this last answer, but I'll ask you to go a little bit further, which has to do with the relationship between the Muslim Brotherhood and al-Qaeda. Since you mentioned that al-Zahawi actually rose, or at least started in the Muslim Brotherhood, but eventually became al-Qaeda, uh, and yet you've mentioned that there's quite a big difference between the two organizations. And on uh, yet another wing of opinion, perhaps represented by some in this administration, is that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is an authentic alternative to al-Qaeda and therefore should be supported. Uh, and yet there are some activities in the Sinai with maybe not al-Qaeda, but al-Qaeda allies that may may or may not be backed by the Muslim Brotherhood. So there's a kind of a muddy picture. I'm wondering if you could just clarify the relationship between the two organizations. Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. Um, look, my, my view, frankly, is that, is that it's actually not that muddy, that um, these, are, these are very distinct organizations, and they have very distinct goals. Um, and you know, well, let's put it like this. The Muslim Brotherhood is a, again, is a, is a rigorous cult. It takes a very, very long time to join it, to become a member of it. You're vetted for your commitment to it um, over, again, many years. So when someone says that someone is a Muslim brother or there's Muslim Brotherhood activity there, um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of gray area there. You kind of either are a Muslim brother and you've gone through this system and you answer to their chain of command, or you don't. And um, just in that vein, you know, the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood, one of the ways that it defines itself is as being a moderate organization. Again, back to that question, uh, you know, the scholars simply regurgitated that talking point. Well, what they mean by that, if you ask them, is we are not al-Qaeda. We are not a global terror organization. We want to come to power through existing institutions because we believe that will be more stable. Now, what they want to do once they're in power is really worth paying attention to. It's very autocratic. It's very totalitarian. It's extremely intolerant. The way they sell themselves is very intolerant. But it is a completely different tactic from al-Qaeda, which practices global terrorism. I mean, and on the Sinai point, um, it's true that many in Egypt believe that the Brotherhood is behind this, and there are all sorts of reports in the Egyptian press about uh, this Brotherhood leader or this guy close to the Brotherhood speaking to operatives in the Sinai. My own view is that there has actually been no compelling evidence of that at all. If anything, what has happened since Morsi was removed is that pre-existing terror organizations in the Sinai have used that as a pretext to up the ante. And not only that, what people in the Sinai are most concerned about 
about since Morrissey's removal is that the relatively lax policing atmosphere that they enjoyed under Morrissey, because Morrissey, uh, you know, kind of wanted a, a freer environment in the Sinai, uh, will be withdrawn and they will return to the very repressive kind of regime that existed in the Sinai under, um, under Mubarak. So um, that's a big part of the reason why you have uh, the, the current jihadism coming out of the Sinai. It's not that it's being directed by the Brotherhood. I would say that, that the, the, the best argument for the Brotherhood's culpability for this is that by um, allowing a, uh, you know, a freer movement or, or whatever in the Sinai, certainly Morsi took a much laxer policy towards jihadis than his predecessors and, and then his successors. But it's not the case. Certainly there's been no, in my view, compelling evidence that, um, that uh, this is the Brotherhood. The next question. Could you discuss the uh, globalization of the Muslim Brotherhood? I know it starts in Egypt, that's its origins, it's where it's strongest, but isn't there um, Brotherhood organizations in dozens of countries, including non-Middle Eastern countries? In over 70 countries, in fact. Um, this is something that the Muslim Brotherhood um, often denies in the United States. If you, you, if you run into Muslim Brothers, and, and I will know that they're Muslim Brothers, um, maybe because they're accompanying a Brotherhood leader who's visiting the United States, maybe, maybe because people within the Egyptian American community have said you know, who they are, and I've, I mean, I've multi-sourced it. Um, but um, but uh, you know, they will deny it here. They will say, oh, we're not Muslim Brothers. Uh, you know. But if you ask people in Egypt, they say, well, yes, of course. You know, we have we have Muslim Brotherhood organizations in over 70 countries. In the United States, it's the Muslim American Society (MAS). This is well known. Um, and uh, and and just on that point, you know, how did this start? Well, some of these branches emerged because, let's say, uh, you know, a, a Syrian Islamist came to Egypt to study, got to know Hassan al banna got to know the Muslim Brothers, returned to Syria founded the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood. That's the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood story. But in some cases, especially in, the, in Europe and the United States, you had Muslim brothers fleeing Egypt or fleeing other countries under repression, then coming and finding very hospitable territory in the West. So, you know, for example, um, uh, the, uh, I believe it's the son-in-law of Hassan al-Banna um, flees to Switzerland, and, and his grandson is Tariq Ramadan, the, the well-known scholar. So, um, you know, and that's something to keep in mind, by the way, that, um, you know, I, I believe that the removal of Morsi, good or bad, is kind of the wrong question. I think it was inevitable. I think the guy lost control of the country. Um, when you lose control and you're, president, and you're president of any country, you just can't remain president. Something's going to give maybe even something worse than a coup. Um, but one of the consequences could be that the Brotherhood continues to internationalize as young Muslim brothers in particular maybe flee uh, elsewhere. So, you know, that's, a, that's a, a, a side effect we have to be very aware of. Cheryl? Um, I had a question because you described the Muslim Brotherhood as a cult-like agency or organization. What happens to individuals who begin or complete the indoctrination process and then want to either withdraw or reject it? Is there an official process within their structure to deal with somebody who no longer is it good riddance? Or does the individual feel like they have to be removed from that area? Um, that's a great question. There's no, as far as I know, and I, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm wrong on this, but as far as I know, there is no actual process for removing Muslim brothers. There's no like ceremony or, or anything like that. Um, but there have been times where uh, Muslim brothers have been banished from the organization for not listening and obeying. The best example of this happened um, after the 2011 revolution when young Muslim brothers did not want, a certain group, I should say, of young Muslim brothers, did not want the Brotherhood to move so quickly to politics, didn't want it to establish a single political party that they would have to vote for. They said, hey, we just had an uprising. This is freedom. We should be Muslim brothers doing outreach and social services, but we should be allowed to vote for any party we want. We should be allowed to form our own party if we choose to, maybe a youth party. They actually held a conference that I attended um, in the Safir Hotel in, uh, in Do'i. Um, in uh, March 2011, they sent a letter to the Supreme Guide. This was a big moment, you know, kind of a few hundred young Muslim brothers sending a letter of protest to the Supreme Guide, their leader, that they're supposed to listen and obey. And the result of this was that they were banished from the organization. 
Um, now, you know, that is probably a very difficult thing for someone who has invested years of their lives trying to join, whose best friends are members. They probably feel a sense of social isolation. And that's why that's actually a very useful weapon for the Brotherhood to keep its rank and file in line. David? This, uh, this cyclical rise and fall of this organization, when it's decapitated, how does it maintain its ideology and how does that not turn on itself you know, with uh, different groups rising to uh, assume the new leadership without any leadership to you know, put it in place? So it's a great question. Um, the short answer would be that it kind of doesn't in the following sense. Remember that the core principle of the Brotherhood's ideology is not anything that's particularly specific to Islam. They don't really have a theology. They don't really have an interpretive approach to the Sharia. There's really no intellectual basis for this at all. They have very few intellectuals. Hassan al-Banna wrote a few things. Syed Qutub wrote a few things, although not all of which he wrote as a Muslim brother. So what is the Brotherhood's ideology? The Brotherhood's ideology is effectively an attachment to an organization. And that actually cannot really survive without the organization. It can only survive in the hearts and minds of the few hundred thousand, in this case, Muslim brothers who no longer have the super organization but still really want it and believe in it and believe that this is the only tool that can effectively achieve an Islamic state, which they haven't defined, and then a global Islamic state. Um, so, you know, if you look at that book I mentioned uh, by, by uh, Richard Mitchell from the 1960s, what's so interesting about it is he's writing at the tail end of that second phase that I described. He's writing at this, during this period where the Muslim brothers are mostly in jail, Syed Qutb has just been hung two years before, and his view is basically that, okay, this is like an interesting historical organization, it rose, here's its story, it fell, end of story, uh, the end. Um, but it reemerges. And how does it reemerge? Well, it reemerges because the people who led this organization come out of prison and then preach it to these kind of young Islamists um, who are not Muslim brothers who are on campus and then bring them into the, the organization. So what I'm saying is that uh, there will probably always be fertile ground for the Brotherhood because there will always be Islamists, but the approach that defines the Brotherhood is one that can only be carried by Muslim Brothers and the organization itself, and if those don't exist and that doesn't exist, it can't exist. Okay, we have time for one more question. All right, well, uh, join me in thanking Eric for a great presentation. Thank you.